This conversation with our guest today is going to be so incredible because she's going to talk about how she was able to juggle business ownership, a cancer diagnosis, and being a mom at the same time. And she's also going to dive into how she chose to use her second chance to truly live life and enjoy the little things, which I feel like is a reminder that we all need to have. So our guest today is a graphic designer and branding specialist that helps small business owners bring their ideas to life through creative design. She is incredibly talented and has been running her business for more than 10 years out of sunny Las Vegas, but works with clients around the world. And this is actually a really special interview for me because she has been one of my clients for a long time, almost two years now, which is crazy. So I'm really excited to connect with her in this new way, introduce her to everybody because she is incredible and her story is so inspirational. So you can learn more about her on her website at double eight design studio.com, or you can find her on Instagram at double eight design studio. So welcome Chelsea Collins. I am so glad that you are here with us today. I'm super, super excited to be a part of not only this podcast, but to share my story. And yeah, so I'm just, I'm really, really excited. Great. Yes, me too. So can you tell everyone how you got started in your business? So what made you choose graphic design all those years ago? So I kind of started out um, being an event planner. Like my story starts with, I mean, I've been a creative since I was a little girl, but I I started as wanting to be an event planner and I wanted to do event planning for the hotels. And I mean, Las Vegas doesn't have a short of them. So I figured this would be the perfect place to be an event planner. And so I started with catering gigs. I had a good friend in the, in, in the, uh, like the field. Um, and he really helped me to kind of, uh, better my craft with event planning and, let me tell you, event planning is a lot of work. And so I just felt like I didn't want to do all of that work all the time. And so I took a different route and um, a friend of mine basically said, look, like the, the invitations and the stuff that you do for design for all of your family and friends, you can do that for a career. And I was like, what? I can? Like, really? Like people would pay me to do that. Like I was so like gobsmacked that I was like, oh my gosh, like that would be so cool. So I went to school, um, at the art Institute of Las Vegas and I got my bachelor's degree in graphic design. And, um, I, I didn't really have any prospects as far as jobs after the end of like graduation. Um, there was either a hotel job or, um, an agency job. And I had just given birth to my son. Um, he's eight now, but way back when it was kind of like, okay, well, like he's little, I, I need to be home. So I decided to just start my own business and I had made a few contacts along the way. And I felt like it would be easier for my family and easier for myself to just kind of jump in feet first and become a business owner. And that way I could be present with my son. So, um, I started my own business, um, officially in 2016. Um, and I have been designing for over 10 years, like you said, and just kind of honing in on my craft and just making it easier. So graphic design is my passion. Um, it's also my link to freedom because as a graphic designer, I could literally go anywhere and still do what I do. So mm-hmm. I just need Wi-Fi and my, my laptop and I'm good to go. Yeah. That laptop lifestyle. We all love it. Yes. <laughs> it's great. So thank you for sharing just a little bit about your background to give people some like insight of how you actually got started with your business. But I would love if you could share like when in your business journey, did you, get that cancer diagnosis and how was your, not only your life, obviously this is an incredible thing that's happening to you, but (laughs) how did this not only affect your life, but your business too? So I actually, um, like over the holiday season in 2017, I, um, I kind of got a, like a bug. I thought that I was coming down with something over the holidays. Like I just wasn't feeling good at all. And then, um, my son had gone back to school 
And I was like, I need to, I need to go to like a quick care or urgent care or something and just get like a Z pack and be on my way. Well, I went to the urgent care, um, January 16th of 2018 or yeah, it was like the 15th or the 16th. And, um, I went there and they basically said, we need to run one more test. We think that maybe either the machine is broken or there's something really wrong with you. And I'm like, oh, great. Okay, cool. Um, So yeah, I mean, that's great news. Um, And so the doctor came back and he's like, "Um, yeah, the machine is fine. It's you. Like you need to go to the hospital right now and get a blood transfusion because you are literally running out of blood. Like we don't know where your blood is going. Um, but you literally have the lowest levels that we've ever seen. And so my doctor called, um, basically labeled it as sepsis, which is a word that scares the crap out of me just because in like when my mom would always get sick or, or not always, but like when she would get sick and they said, Oh, it's, uh, like septic. Well, when I think of septic, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like that means you're going to die soon because it's gone to your bloodstream. But for this intents and purposes, they basically, um, dubbed me sepsis to kind of, um, let people know in the hospital that it's severe and that I cannot like be sat in the waiting room. Like I need to be seen right away. So I called my mom and I said, can you meet me at Summerlin hospital? Like, I need you to like meet me there. Like they were like, Oh, we can put you in an ambulance. I'm like, no, no, like I'll drive myself. But walking from the parking structure to the hospital, it felt like I ran a marathon and I literally felt like a truck had hit me. Like I, it took everything like heavy breathing to get to that point, um, to the front door of the hospital. So, um, but yeah, I was seen right away. They did every test under the sun to kind of figure out where my blood was going. I had like, um, a strep test. I had like everything done just to see, um, if they could do like a, um, an elimination type of thing. Um, so I actually had a blood transfusion in the ER, which they never do, but I was in an isolation room. So they, um, it was safe for them to do so. Um, and so I was admitted that night and then the next morning or that night, like everyone was gone home. My, uh, doctor had come in and she said, um, it's not looking good. It looks like it's leukemia, but we don't, we don't have your genetic markers back. So we don't know what kind of leukemia because leukemia, there's quite a few different leukemias out there. Um, so my, once I got my genetic markers back, it was, um, I was diagnosed with AML, which is, oh, if I can remember acute myeloid leukemia. And, um, I believe my subtype was M3. And that just meant like, before I got like my exact diagnosis, I went online and I was like, what's my prognosis? Like, do I have like a chance? And I was really the worst thing that you can do. Yes. Like it is the worst thing. Like it's one thing that I tell people don't do it. Like take my advice, don't do it. And, um, so it said that I had a 40%, a 40% chance of surviving it. Um, and that was just leukemia on its own without like my subtype, like without my exact, um, one, but my doctor, my oncologist who is kick ass, like I have to say, like she, she was a drill sergeant, but she was the type of doctor I needed because she didn't give me any fluff. She literally just told me like it was, um, her name is Dr. Thamala. She runs here at the cancers or the cancer center of Nevada. Um, and she is amazing. And so I had a lot of tests to do to get that diagnosis. One of them was, um, a bone marrow biopsy and it hurt a lot. (laughs) Like I think out of my entire time in the hospital, I probably had like six of them. And the first one was the worst because I didn't know what to expect. And they didn't give me as much, um, 
pain meds that I could have had. So the next ones, I definitely asked for them <laughs> and twilight, which allowed me to kind of calm down just because of the impending doom. I knew that was coming to my lower backside. Um, but yeah, so my diagnosis came and my, like, I had a huge support team, like my mom and my brother, my brother was my chemo buddy. Um, he would bring one of his friends and we would play games and we would order food from Grubhub and they would deliver to our room. And like, and I literally just made my hospital, the hospital, like kind of my, my environment. Like I had to kind of adopt that. Okay. This is where I'm going to be living for the next month and a half. The first round was a month and a half in the hospital. I literally went in and I did not leave until like a month and a half later. And that was a huge shock because I didn't know I had to call my son's dad and make sure that he could like step up and take care of him while I was in the hospital. I had to figure out a long-term plan for my dog. And so it was just kind of like an overwhelming thing where like you think that you're going to go and get like a Z pack and then you go in and you have a leukemia diagnosis and you're like, okay, like, okay. First I have to like not be overwhelmed and just kind of take one thing at a time and get some sort of control back. Cause being your own advocate in that hospital is like the biggest thing. Um, like I had to really learn what I could and couldn't do. And in a hospital, you have all the power. Like you can, you can like hear what the doctors say and the nurses say, but it's ultimately your choice, which I never understood. Like I, I never knew that that was a possibility. So I had to do chemo. Um, I actually had the opportunity to do a alternative chemo. Um, my levels were so incredibly low that, um, one of the on-call, um, oncologists suggested that I take this alternative chemo, which would only be, I would only be hooked up to an IV for two hours, um, instead of like 24, seven, seven days a week. Um, and it, I wouldn't have a lot of adverse side effects. So I wouldn't lose my hair. I wouldn't, um, if I did lose my hair, it would thin out, which was fine because my hair is naturally really thick. So I was like, that's perfect. <laughs> um, and then obviously um, I could have nausea, but I didn't, like I didn't have any of the normal side effects with chemo. And my chemo, my alternative chemo was called arsenic, which scared my mom because she was like arsenic doesn't that like rat poison and I was like well, all chemo is poison <clears throat> that is like the whole point of um chemo like they want to kill off everything and so the first the first round of chemo um like I said it like my body was fighting for like to to survive so I literally was asleep for a lot of it. People would come in and out. Um, and then at the end of that, I would have a month off. And then the next month I would have to go in and like kind of like be recommitted into the hospital. And it felt like it felt like a jail sentence. It really did. Like I felt like I was in my own little prison because the outside world was moving on without me. So it was it was definitely imperative for me to kind of do things to help my mental health, because when you're locked in a hospital and you have to have treatment for a month at a time, like it could definitely, like there were a couple of times where I could have went down a rabbit hole that Alice couldn't even get out of. Like it was really something that I had to work on. And so I did a little bit of work here and there, like my business, um, I had to kind of put that on the back burner because I couldn't very well do all of my client work to um, the ability that I used to outside of the hospital. So I had like one or two new clients and, and then I kind of just stopped doing it because I couldn't give them the, the customer and client um, uh, service that I had envisioned in giving my clients. So I didn't want to continue working on. So 
I did a little bit of work my second round in there just to kind of keep me sane. <laughs> um, and then I had a month off. And then I had to go in for the last or the last uh, round. I finally got approved for outpatient um, chemotherapy, which um, was a blessing. It the hospital for the first two rounds thought it would be um, financially sound for me to be in a hospital when it was way more expensive than doing outpatient. So my oncologist really fought for me to get outpatient because that meant that I had more time to spend with my family and more time to spend with my son. Because if I was in the hospital, that was another month away from my son. And so I just, it was very heartbreaking for me to know that I couldn't be there for him. And so he came to visit like once or twice, but I just didn't want him to be in that, that atmosphere because it was around like the flu season. And I was like, no, I don't want you coming to the hospital to see me because I don't want you getting sick. Like, I don't want you coming here and then getting sick because you came to see me. Um, but <clears throat> after the last month, um, while I was an outpatient, I started really kind of looking inward at my business and kind of saying like, my business is kind of like a Phoenix coming out of the ashes now, because now I can really <clears throat> do that foundational um, work for my business that I never really did because I kind of just jumped in and did it. Um, so that's kind of where you came into it, Steph, was when I was kind of wanting to revamp my business and kind of really understand how to scale my business. And that one-on-one -on -one coaching that I started with you was a turning point for my business. And it really allowed me to kind of take the second chance of being in remission um, and really make it to where I can now help people get those brands designed that they want and have the confidence in them. Um, because that's kind of where I want to be in life. I want to help people. Um, I feel like I've been on this earth to do so. And um, by designing these brands that people are wanting to design is just icing on the cake. It really is. So I definitely am glad that I'm in remission. It'll be three years. I think it's just, it's just over three years in remission. And the closer and closer I get to the five-year mark, my oncologist basically said, there's, if it hasn't relapsed now, like it's not going to, there's a very, very, very slim chance that it will. Um, but I go and see my oncologist every six months to do a checkup. She checks my, my levels and makes sure that everything is going well. Um, especially the effects of what chemo can do after the effect or after the fact, because, um, like, I can tell you one thing, my body has definitely changed since chemo. Um, I mean, I've been very adverse to heat and like the sun and everything just because of my pale skin and I burn very easily and I get hot easily, but now heat will, if I'm in the heat for too long, like it'll be an instant case of heat stroke and chemo has definitely been one of those like factors that has kind of changed things. Um, just how my body kind of reacts to certain aspects of my life. Um, chemo brain is definitely a real thing. I know that every cancer survivor who has done chemo will totally tell you that it literally, like you can have a conversation with someone and then stop mid sentence because you, you don't know where it was going. Like you have no idea what you were going to talk about. And so that has definitely affected the way that I do business just because now I get more anxiety talking about, um, like my business or talking about business related things with my clients, because I don't want to come off as I am forgetful or I don't remember things and not everyone knows my story. So I don't want to ever come off as unprofessional. And that's like my, my greatest fear now having gone through chemo and, and my experience, um, I never want it to affect adversely to my business. 
and how my clients see me. And so I always, I always tend to kind of do like a disclaimer almost and be like, so sorry today. Like my chemo brain is really affecting me. And so that way it's, it's kind of like my way of, I don't know, putting it out there and hopefully that they will, um, allow me to have some grace (laughs) just because working with clients is something I love to do. I love hearing their story, hearing their why for their branding and just creating a brand that really makes them stand out and allows their story to shine through. But also with the chemo brain, it definitely makes it a little tough. Um, but it doesn't stop me. Like I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to power through, but there are certain days that chemo, my chemo brain, um, really acts up. So. Yeah, for sure. It's funny that you mentioned that because I didn't even find out about you, your diagnosis until like, I think it was a couple of months ago when yeah. I've known you for such a long time. And I was like, I had no idea. And I think you said, oh, it's my chemo brain. And I'm like, you're, you're what, what are you're you right. talking about? <laughs> I didn't, I had no idea. So yeah, I'm just so glad that you are sharing your story with the world because it is so inspiring for other people to hear, even if they're not necessarily getting diagnosed with cancer and going through it, but it's just kind of like, like you said, like defying the odds, overcoming something that you thought you only had a 40% chance of surviving from thanks to the internet and uh, like really continuing to push through. So I do have a couple of questions for you. I was writing down as you were talking, I didn't want to interrupt you because you were just like, in this yeah. flow state. I was like trying to get it out and I was trying to like do the timeline. So that yeah. way it wasn't like all over the place. Cause that's another thing that chemo brain does. I'm like, Oh wait. And so, yeah, I have yeah. to make sure that I'm like following yeah. the timeline <laughs> for sure. So I would love to know, like, do you think that this diagnosis and just this experience of having cancer, do you think that allowed you to become a better business owner and designer in general? Yeah, I think that like they always say, if you brush up against death, like you definitely see your life differently on the other side. Um, I've always been someone that lives life to the fullest. Like if there's ever an opportunity, I grab it. But now after going through the diagnosis, going through my journey with cancer and going on to the other side in remission, I think that having this second chance allows me to be more present with my family. It allows me to definitely jump on the opportunities that are given to me to work with nonprofit work or um, just other ways to help other people. Um, But also with my business, it allows me to, with your help, of course, I've been able to now um, structure my business to where now I can have, I can take clients that I want to work with that I would dream to work with. So it has definitely, um, made my business more structured after going through everything and just being like, I need to make that this business, um, work for me and allow me to have the freedoms like time and being able to vacation wherever I want, whenever I want, I mean, even this year alone, July, it was like two major, um, two major vacations, um, at the, the beginning of July and the end of July. And I was able to do that with the help of you and coaching my business, but also just saying, I'm not going to let my business or trying to get money for bills to keep me from doing something, especially if I have the savings to do it. So it definitely going through everything that I have, I definitely don't take things for granted anymore. I basically kind of, I don't know, grab the bull by the horns and just go with it because life is very short. And I know it's a cliche to say something like that, but going through like a life threatening type of Uh, disease and making it on the other side definitely makes that cliche, not a cliche. Like life is too short to not do what you want to do. Like YOLO, you only live once. Like that is 
100% true. And you got to do all the opportunities and grab them and just go with your heart and what you want to do and just like trust your gut. Honestly. I mean, that's what I had to do with a lot of my, my cancer journey in the hospital is I had to kind of take my instincts and, and kind of hold them true. And my doctor definitely was on my side. So I was thankful for that. And I had a great team while I was doing all of my um, treatment and everything in the hospital. So I think that definitely after remission, all I want to do is take any opportunity that I can to work with someone I've wanted to work with or um, help people in any way, whether that's working with a nonprofit or um, volunteering my time. I love that. And thank you so much for saying those nice things about me. It's been incredible working with you, first of all, but I mean, and this is so, why I'm so passionate about what I do too, because I don't want people to feel like they're chained to their businesses because like you right. said, life, life can change at any point. I mean, yes. like I've had, I haven't any had anything. Reason. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now I haven't had anything crazy like that happen to me in my life. And frankly, I hope that doesn't happen, but, um, me as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, it could be anything that pops up at any time. So it's so important to have those structures, have those boundaries in place and really sh- think about how you're going to strategically build your business so that it can survive for the long term instead of just looking at it from a day-to-day perspective. Um, so I'm really glad that yeah. you talked about that. And I know you talked more about like how you live your life differently now, but do you have any advice Like maybe somebody's going through this right now, or maybe they have a family member or friend that's going through a similar situation? Can you just share your two cents on your advice that you would give to people. And also before I forget, I know that you are writing a companion book as well for people who are um, going through their own cancer journey. So do you mind sharing a little bit about that too? Yeah. So a little bit of the companion book, I started writing it when I was in the hospital because I knew that, um, that once treatment has started full force and the more and more I took of it, uh, of chemo that my, my brain wouldn't function the same way as remembering everything. And so there are things that definitely have, um, kind of meshed together. So I don't really know the timeline on it, but I know that it happened. And I think that that's the most important part. So the companion book is literally just me talking about my experience and what to expect. Um, also, um, just certain things that I did while in the hospital to kind of help me overcome, um, the mental struggles as well as, um, dealing with the medications that they would give you. And, um, so it just kind of gives advice as well as, um, takes you through because in, when you have chemo, more than likely you'll either get a port or a pick line. And they're two completely different things. Um, a port is more long-term and pick line is just for your treatment. And so I, my doctor basically ordered me to have a pick line. So I would explain what those are for people who aren't familiar. Yeah. Yeah. So a port basically would go like, it's like inside your skin. Like it literally is like a surgical procedure that they put the port in. Um, and it literally has like lines coming in, um, from what my understanding is of it. And, um, these lines are to give medication and also take blood for, um, all of your vitals and all that kind of stuff, levels and everything. Um, a pick line literally goes right there. You can even see my, my, my scar from the one, um, and, like it'll literally for anybody be, who's not watching the video, she's pointing to her, like her upper arm. Like, yeah. So what, like my upper person. arm, like, yeah. yeah, it's like the fatty part of my upper arm, basically the um, inside of your upper arm. <laughs> yes. My inside of my upper arm. So it is, um, it's a procedure that's done in the hospital room. They kind of make it a sterile environment and they thread it through, um, 
uh, up, like up my arm into where my heart is. And it literally connects to one of the veins in my heart. Um, from what I understand, from what they told me, like they literally take an ultrasound of it to make sure that they pick the right vein. Um, and it, and then there's like a, a, like a plastic tube that comes out. I think there's two of them and it literally stays in your arm the entire time. So there's like a plastic adhesive that gets put over the area. So that way, um, cause water and like dirt and anything can't get in there, um, or else it'll cause problems. So the two, um, plastic tubes that come out, those are for the same thing as the port where it will be, um, you can take blood out for vitals and levels, um, as well as administer, um, like chemo and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and it takes away, so a port and a pick line takes away from, getting an IV and having an IV in because having an IV in either in your arm or your hand is not really feasible for a long term, just because more than likely it's going to, a vein is going to blow and you're going to have to get it reset. So pick lines and ports are mainly for the easeability of getting treatment and giving blood. So and that's kind of like all those type of things of what I went through is in my companion book. I have been writing this off and on um, since I was in remission, which is July 11th of 2018. So it's been a labor of love. Um, life has definitely gotten in the way a few times. And so I literally just kind of... Um, I kind of go back and forth to writing it and I do want to finish it. My goal is to finish it by like the beginning of next year. Um, just because the holiday season for me is when it's like my downtime. I don't really, I take the time off. So I'm really um, giving myself the goal to ut utilize that time to finish it and then self-publish it on Amazon or however I can do it. Um, and I almost think that I, I want to um, get a few bound um, and actually bring it to the Summerlin hospital that I was at um, because the nurses, when I was writing it, they were like, do you know how many people ask for something like this to, and even when I got diagnosed, I looked everywhere on online to like people's experiences or a blog or something that allowed me to get a glimpse on what I had coming. And I think it's so important that for those that are like me, that kind of want to have like a heads up. So they know what's going instead of going in it blind. Um, it, like having that companion book will be kind of like, um, a glimpse into what could happen. Now, obviously my journey is different from everyone else, but there could be times where you have similarities. And I think that my biggest, um, my biggest advice um, for someone who's going through something like that, or a, even a loved one that's going through something similar is to become, become your own advocate when it comes to your treatment. Um, ask questions. No question is a stupid question. Um, that is huge because I can tell you one time I had my pick line in and someone had come in to draw blood on me. And I, I, I questioned it. I said, why are you coming in to take blood when you can get it from my pick line? And they were like, it's been ordered. So I had called my nurse and I said, Hey, like, is this for me? Like, if it's for me, I'll take it. But I want to make sure that this has been for me. And it was actually not for me. It was actually for a patient in next door. So my nurse had put a sign on my door that says, please check with the nurse's station before entering, because you don't ever want to put yourself in a situation where it could um, harm your treatment or harm your way, because the people that work in the hospital, it could be an honest mistake. Like they could have gotten the the, um, the room numbers mixed up, like you have no idea what's going on in the hospital. So being your own advocate is huge. And also 
My other biggest one is to be kind to the nurses because they are the ones who do all of the work. They are the ones that the doctors come in, check on you, make sure that you are being administered your medication and they order it. But your nurses are the ones who are with you 24 seven a day, like as long as you're in there. And honestly, they don't like, uh, everyone has bad days in the hospital. I'm, I'm not saying that that's uh, not the case, but being kind to your nurses um, is going to get you a lot further than being unkind. Um, when I was in the hospital, the nurses fought over me to have me as their rotation because, um, I was very self-sufficient. I had my laptop. I binge watched like all the shows that I could never watch because I didn't have time when I had all the time to do it. Um, I literally had my mom or anyone else go to the grocery store to get me food because the cafeteria food or the food that the hospital does horrible. I made the mistake of doing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich who can totally mess up a PB and J. I have no idea, but the hospital did it. Um, it tastes like cardboard. So I had my friend or either my friends or my family go to the grocery store with my stuff and. I literally made the hospital room my own little safe haven because it's something that you had to do in order to stay sane and just also have a little bit of control. Um, I was given like every day I asked my nurse if they would give me my levels because that kind of gave me an idea of what my day would look like if I was getting a blood transfusion or if I had to get platelets um, all of that kind of stuff. So if you can have any type of control where you want to know what your levels are in the morning, have like a nurse tell you, okay, these are your normal levels. Like if your levels fall into these numbers, then you're normal and you're on to better things. Like that is your goal. Um, I was very, very low. So my goal was a lofty one trying to get there. Um, but being able to, and then have a countdown. Like if they tell you, okay, you have to go through this many days of treatment, then you can kind of cross them off and, and slowly, but surely your goal for each day will, will change. And by having a goal for each day, whether it's, I want to get through this season of whatever show it is, or I want to read this many books while I'm here or something to just keep your mind engaged um, is huge. And then also for visitors, I would say have um, kind of like a schedule. I had so many visitors, which I'm thankful for, but I had so many visitors that there were a couple of times where I was like, I just want to be alone. Like, I don't want to be on right now. Like I want to be able to just kind of wallow and uh, like put my, my curtains like together to where it's like not, um, super sunny and just literally be on my computer and either binge watch a show or watch a movie and just be alone with myself. So having that schedule for visitors will definitely come in handy. Same thing people will like buy me lunch and they'll like, they're like, Oh, I'm coming to visit you. Do you want anything? I'm like, I'll take a Starbucks. That would be great. So, I mean, just having that, um, support is insane and it makes it go that much further. If you don't have support, I would definitely lean on your, your nurses, like find one of your nurses that you absolutely love. I think I had like two or three of my favorites on the day shift and the night shift. And, um, you just kind of have to make it your own journey and do everything that you can to make the best of it. Um, bring in board games. Like if your room is big enough, bring in a board game, bring cards to play, like make, like obviously walk around the hospital if you can. I couldn't just because I was tethered to a pole and I really didn't want to, um, worry about that pole because it had, um, a bum, uh, wheel kind of like when you go to the grocery store, when you get that cart that like literally is annoying to push around, that was my ID pole. So (laughs) I didn't really walk around, but it is important to kind of either stay somewhat active if you are allowed to 
Um, but at least keep your mind engaged because that's going to help in the long run for sure. Advice has been so incredible. And as somebody who's married to a nurse, my husband's a nurse, I know that he would really appreciate you saying that because yeah. <laughs> nurses, nurses do a lot. He's not in the cancer um, area of the hospital, but he is in a different right. area of the hospital, but yes, they do. A well, lot I work. have, I have one story that I want to mention with a nurse who went above and beyond. Like he was actually, um, I think it's a CNA. Is that what the acronym is? I think it's a CNA. So uh, he was like a certified nurse, nurse assistant. assistant. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So he was my first CNA. He was, um, he was my nurse the when I got admitted and they give you a, like a, like a, like a big tumbler type of, uh, cup for like ice and everything like that and water. And so he's like, here's some ice, here's some water. Um, and I was like, Oh, can you help me pour it into the cup that I got from the hospital? And he's like, Oh, you're going to be one of those, aren't you? And I'm like, one of what? <laughs> and he was like, high maintenance. And I was like, Oh no, I'm not high maintenance. I was like, you should know this. I am not a high maintenance person. I just don't want to spill it everywhere. And so he's like, okay, I'll be back with some palm leaves so I can fan you later. And I was like, okay, go ahead. I'll take it. And so that, that like banter was amazing to kind of, kind of get my mind off of things. And he had come back and he had made a scepter out of like hospital grade materials. <laughs> and, um, it was funny. Cause I was like, well, where's my tiara? Like I need a tiara to go with this scepter. And he was like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And so I had written him a note, um, as like a thank you. I wrote every, every nurse, a note, like a handwritten note, um, just thanking me or thanking them for taking care of me the way that they did. And I think it was my, it was like my second to last week in the hospital before I was out for my second round. And he was on the floor. Normally he wasn't, he was on the pediatric pediatric floor and he came up and he, um, he was like, Oh, Hey, it's you. I was like, yeah, it's me. Like, um, it's great to see you. I actually missed having you as my CNA. And he was like, I, I'm working on something for you. And then um, I'll be back later. And I was like, okay. And um, he, he had mentioned, he's like, you know, that note that you wrote me, like I carry it with me every single day. He's like, I deal with a lot of crap. And he was like, your note literally lifts me up anytime that I need like a pick me up. So He's like, I have to thank you for that. And so he, it was like the end of the shift. I thought like maybe he had forgotten me and he came in and he made a crown tiara out of like, I don't know what he made it out of, but it was, per, it's in my, it's in my safe right now because I don't want to ever like miss it because that right there was like icing on the cake. Like he did something maybe small to him, but it was huge for me because he remembered when I had said, where's my tiara? Like I need a tiara with a scepter. <clears throat> and That's so nice that, yeah, like nurses really can go above and beyond. If you show them a little kindness, like they will, they'll be your biggest cheerleader if you let them. So yeah, I mean, he was definitely one of my favorite CNAs for sure. And just him going above and beyond with that crown. Like, even my mom was like, did you, did he really give you a crown? I'm like, yes, he handmade this out of hospital, like materials that were scraps. And I was like, so I, and he painted it and everything. Like I'll have to show a picture of it. I'll send it to you stuff so you can see it. But it was definitely something that put a smile on my face the last couple of weeks before I, I was out of the hospital. So nurses are, amazing human beings. And we are blessed to have them in our lives. If we ever get landed in the hospital, because they will fight for you. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been so incredible. Thank you so much for coming here, sharing your story and just getting really real about what actually happens when sometimes things don't go to plan. And 
Um, yeah. just sh- sharing about how you were able to pivot things in your business and how things are going now. So I am just so grateful for you. I'm so grateful that you are here. And yes, I mean, I also want to just mention before I forget, not only nurses, but just people in general, like go above yes. and beyond for other people. If whether it's your clients or somebody on the street, that's never a bad thing to do. Right. So yeah, pay it forward, like do some, like pay for someone's coffee in front of you. Like doing something kind every single day will bring more kindness to the world. Like I have a thing that says throw kindness, like the confetti, because it's, it's so important to, um, be kind whenever you can. I absolutely agree. And yes, whenever I'm in line somewhere, I try to pay for somebody's order, um, because it's just like a nice surprise for them. Right. So, um, yeah. So I shared your website earlier. Again, it's double eight design studio and it's the letter or the number eight, <laughs> double eight design yes. studio.com. <laughs> and your Instagram is the same double eight, the number design studio, but is there anywhere else that people should reach out to you or, um, is Instagram the best place? Instagram is definitely the best place. And, um, <clears throat> my podcast is also linked to that as well. So anyone needing any branding tips at all, you can definitely listen to the first season. Um, The last two episodes are this month. So this one's this coming next Wednesday and the Wednesday after will be the last two until season two comes out in spring of next year. Awesome. Love it. Thank you again for being here. And um, just thank you for sharing your story.